social media, it can become a popularity trap and a time suck, but it can also be a great way to grow your farm business and get word out there about your farm and your farm product. Today, it's all about using social media to grow farm sales. Coming up. Welcome to Grass-Fed Life. I'm your host, Diego, D-I-E-G-O. Today's another episode featuring farmer Paul Grieve of Primal Pastures and Pasture Bird. Paul's family has been very successful over the past five plus years growing their enterprise from one that started with just 50 chicks being raised on pasture to being one of the largest pastured poultry producers in the U.S., if not the world. Yes, they're that big, and they only started with 50 chicks on a whim one weekend. One of their keys to growth has been social media. From day one, Paul's gone out and done interviews, posted on Facebook, posted on Instagram, to try and provide his customers and potential customers with a view inside their farm, give them value, and mix in that educational content with the occasional right hook of a sales pitch. Over time, they've seen what worked and what hasn't. I know a lot of people think social media can be overwhelming, it can be confusing, and results can be poor, but here's one example of a farm that really used social media to go big, really big. What you're going to hear today is one of Paul Greaves presentations on using social media to increase your farm revenue. While this was a presentation given live, I think just listening to the audio will suffice. It'll be fine. But if you want to see the presentation, be sure to sign up on our mailing list at grassfedlife.co because later this week we'll be sending out an email with this presentation in it. And if you hear this presentation and you want to learn more from Paul Grieve and Darby and myself, come on out to Primal Pastures, Paul Grieve's farm, to learn all about how they took primal pastures from 50 chicks to over 200,000. You're going to learn how they do production on a big scale, how they do marketing, how they do distribution, how they do aggregation. It's the Growing Your Farm Business Mastermind Workshop. There's only six tickets left for the event. Yes, just six total tickets left. So be sure to get your ticket before it sells out. Given that we're about six weeks out from the workshop, I don't think those six tickets are going to last. For more information on the Growing Your Farm Business Mastermind and to get your hands on one of the last remaining tickets, visit grassfedlife.co. Now let's jump into it with the social media farm marketer, Paul Grieve of Primal Pastures. I'm a farmer. Uh, I'll get a little bit in my background. I'm a full-time farmer. That's what I do for a living. I don't have time for 30 different social media outlets. I don't, I don't have time for it. I focus my time on the two that give me the most leverage and that generate the most revenue um, and allow me to to connect with my customers. So what are we gonna talk about today? I'm calling this the Gorilla Marketing Field Guide for Small Farms and Gardens. (laughs) Yeah. 13 strategies to market your permaculture, keep you in business, not only keep you in business. Sustainability is like treading water, right? We wanna do better than sustainability. We want to regenerate. We want to grow profits. We want things to be growing on our farm, including including the money that we're taking home. <clears throat> in my opinion, when we're going to actually see a dynamic change throughout the entire industry is when people are able to take, like Joel says, white collar salaries off of farms. As soon as you can take white collar salaries off of farms, you're going to see a lot of people get into this. A lot of people are scared to take the big jump. You know, they don't want to go work for fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. They want to be able to have a, a valid lifestyle they want to be able to provide for a family. So once we can do that, and that's a combination of raising things, doing things the right way on our farms, but also marketing things the right way. If we can't do that, this thing's not going to take off. And we all want it to take off. I know that. Here's my vomit slide. This is everything we're going to talk about in uh, the least organized format possible. Uh, These are the 13 different strategies that have worked for us very well on our farm so far. A little bit of background. I'm not here to to, uh, talk about my farm. But I want to give you guys some context so you know where I'm coming from. I'm not just a marketing guy. I am a full-time farmer. My farm is called Primal Pastures. It's located about 15 minutes from here, Temecula, California. Um, this is my myself, my two brothers-in-law, and my father-in-law. We basically started with 50 chicks in our backyard. 
Uh, we all had a different way of getting into it, but I personally had arthritis. I was sick in my knees and my elbows. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Thought I was eating healthy, standard American diet. Come on, what's wrong with me? I'm 22. College athlete, right? Um, inflammation, man, it was killing me from a young age. So as soon as I got that inflammation out, I started to realize, wow, our food is really connected to our health. Uh, where can I find clean, healthy food? Where do I get this stuff from? Um, we were able to find some veggies locally. We were able to find some beef locally. Chicken was nowhere to be found. It was either Northern California, you gotta go all the way out to outside of the state or even outside of the country to find any decent pasture-raised chicken, raised on grass, no soy, no GMO, none of the junk, just eating the bugs and worms and scratching for organic feed like they should be. So we, we, we uh, did the opposite of what most people do. We didn't think about it very much. We just ordered chicks, <laughs> put them outside on grass, um, didn't read a whole lot of books, probably should have read a couple more books before we did it, but we, uh, we went for it. We put a bunch of chicks outside on grass, and I put uh, two posts on Facebook. Yeah, this is what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. I think it'd be cool um, if anybody happens to want one. We were just going to eat them all ourselves. We've got a big family. We can go through 50 <laughs> birds pretty quick. I said, but if anybody wants one, you know, here's the link. You can put a deposit down, um, and you can reserve your bird. Two weeks later, chicks are this big, right? All 50 are sold out, 100%. And my family's like, come on, man, I thought we were going to get some chicken out of the deal. Like, Maybe next month. So all sold out. By the end of eight weeks when we processed them, uh, we had 110 people on a waiting list. We're here in Southern California, right? 22 million people. We made the thing available, and people really responded like crazy. So what do we do next? We ordered 100 chicks next month. Sold them out. 150. Sold them out. Got up to about 400. We're about 400 right now. I mean, selling out consistently. Our eggs which are not cheap, right? We raise pastured eggs on grass, free range, rotating, doing all the stuff, organic soy free, eight bucks a dozen, 15 minutes a month, you know, online, pre-sold, sold out, crazy. Um, we had the opportunity to get um, some sheep. We, we leased some land, we leased about 50 acres here locally and uh, wanted to get the mob stock and stuff going with the sheep and start getting the benefit of the land. Got in way over our head. We should have started with five or ten sheep, but we went straight for a hundred. Uh, had some awesome results, though. Look at this. So this is May 1st, 2013, going into the dry season. Kind of at the end of spring, you see how dry and nasty it looks. August 1st, in the middle of summer here in Southern California. We're irrigating, but at the same time, we're rotating, doing all this stuff. We had some awesome results um, using the sheep, but it was just, it was, a lot, it was a lot to learn with. hundred sheep. If you've never done livestock before, it's a lot to learn with, so... So we're doing chicken and lamb at that point. Um, next type is right over here, the guy that introduced you. He has an orange grove, avocado, lemon, uh, organic farm. And so now we're raising some pasture turkeys in between the orchards, which is really awesome. So this, we just started this uh, like a month ago. Tyfe and I are working together to do sort of heritage pasture turkey deal in between the groves. Super cool. So now we got, uh, what do we have? Chicken, eggs, lamb, and turkey, all pasture raised. Of course, we have the dogs, guard dogs. That's baby Jane. She's about nine weeks. That picture was just taken like a week ago. So um, Anatolian Shepherd, Great Pyrenees for the big guys and Great Pyrenees Pure for Jane. So yeah, they're awesome guard dogs. They do a really good job. As long as you have two, don't have one guard dog, it doesn't work. We started noticing that our market was really growing, like crazy growing. And, and what we noticed was that when we just had the chicken, it was good. But then when we brought in the lamb, people said, oh, that's so awesome. I can come and pick up chicken and lamb at the same time. Instead of just getting chicken, then we start chicken sales go even harder because they could get two products at the same time. So we're like, well, we don't have the lamb do beef yet, but what if we did? What would happen? So we contacted this guy, a local rancher in Big Bear, California, if you're familiar with where that is. Um, beautiful 4,000 acres of grasslands, and he does you know, grass-fed operation there. And so we started buying live animals from him. And we noticed the same thing. When we had more product available for the people, they were able to buy more. And so we started seeing the market grow. So now we're up to chicken, eggs, lamb, turkey, beef. And of course, the only natural thing would be to add in some hogs. So uh, we work with Cook Pigs Ranch down in Julian, California. They have a free range hog operation down there. Um, and so we buy their whole animals too. So now we're up to like six different species selling to our customers um, all through the website. And I'll explain that a little bit. We've also added in some interesting, just other products. We sell some paleo bread, and we sell some really good raw and filtered honey um, all through the website. So let me break that down, how that works a little bit. Uh, we pre-sell everything uh, on our website. And we go for the holy grail of small farm marketing, which is direct-to-consumer. 
in my opinion, if you can get direct to consumer business, you have to do it. Um, not only are you getting a higher price point, but the beauty of doing direct consumer business is, let's say I have 500 customers. I have, about, I have about four or 500 customers a month, kind of on a rotating basis. They don't all order every single month, but that's about how many people that we're serving right now. Um, let's say Chipotle came in and they said, I will buy every last bit of product that you have for the same price that all these direct consumer people would buy. Um, in my opinion, turn that down 100% of the time if you have the direct consumer market. Why? You say Chipotle is going to give you a contract, you got guaranteed income, you got all this stuff going on. Well, here's the problem. All it takes is Chipotle to have a new manager come in <coughs> the next month, cancel the order, and you're done, right? You're cut off. If you're relying all your sole energy on one person, one place, two places, three places, you're going to be in trouble. So we have four or 500 people. What are the chances that 200 of those people suddenly that have been ordering every single month just decide to drop off. Zero percent. It's not going to happen. So we go for that direct to consumer market because of the price point, but because you're also diversifying your risk um, when you give access to more and more people like that. So we have six drop sites throughout Southern California. We take our pre orders on our website online ahead of time, collect the cash, and then we basically take this route. So we start in Temecula, drive up to Pasadena, LA, Long Beach, Irvine. Oceanside, well, actually Carlsbad, and then back up to Temecula. It takes us one day to distribute our product every month. So we spend about eight hours on the road, no farmer's markets, no nothing. Uh, once a month, we distribute $20,000, $30,000 of product and we're done with it. We can get back to farming and marketing, doing the stuff that we should be doing instead of sitting around uh, at farmer's markets, you know, chatting, which is nice, but I'd rather be farming and, and spending time with my family than sitting around farmer's markets. We don't, we don't have a big egg business right now. So the question was, are they comfortable getting product and eggs once a month? And we have a small egg business right now. Most of our eggs we just sell on the farm. We open up the farm stand like once a month for a few hours, and people are good with that. This is what we, well, this is what we used to look like. Just throw a deep freezer in the back of the pickup truck, and uh, that worked for about $5,000 in sales. And as it's grown, we have more and more freezers in the back of our pickup truck now. We're hauling a trailer with uh, freezers in the, in the bed of the pickup truck, and then uh, Freezers in the back of the trailer too, so um, we don't have a delivery truck. Everybody brags about not having a tractor. We didn't even have a pickup truck for like the first three months. <laughs> so I was driving around my little convertible, little cheese ball car for a while and hauling fence posts and hay bales and all that stuff. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> but now we have pickup trucks, so we're totally legit farmers, right? <laughs> I'm going to get into the 13 uh, different strategies that I think are. Critical for us, they're not going to apply to every single person in every single scenario. I totally understand that, but I'm hoping that you can walk away with kind of a toolbox of maybe three or four new strategies that you haven't thought of before. These, again, they're tailored to farms and gardens, uh, people that are creating beautiful landscapes, beautiful products. We want to tell the story of our product because people want to be around it. They're very passionate about it. So these aren't really in order of importance, but uh, they're just the order that they came to my mind. I'm also going to make specific recommendations on certain products like this, our website, we use Shopify. There's five or ten different, uh, different website platforms that are good, totally get it, but I'm going to tell you what we use, um, and if you guys, you know, if you want to go to do the research, go for it. But we, uh, I believe website is super key. It's cool to have a Facebook page, it's cool to have some other stuff, but if you don't have people coming to your website where they can put their information down and they can get information about your place very easily, you're missing a lot of business. Shopify is a platform where you don't need to know how to code. If you can drop pictures into a PowerPoint or a Word document, you can make a Shopify website very easily. It doesn't need to be fancy. doesn't need to be cool. Um, just have some, have some photos and have some information. Up. Um, 14 bucks a month, you, you will cover that payment far and away. That's another theme I want to focus on is I'm, on our farm, marketing is not an expense item. It's a revenue item. It's an income item. So we make money on our marketing. It's not something that we spend a bunch of money on. We are focused on making money off of marketing. I'll show you how we're doing that. One of those is the website. So one thing I really like about Shopify, and I'll plug that, is that they've got an incredible inventory management uh, protocol. They've got a great app on your phone. I can manage everything from my smartphone. I can take payment. I can reduce my inventory, add my inventory. We have 85 different products on there now between all the different beef cuts and lamb cuts and all the different stuff. It's a cinch to manage all that stuff with the with the Shopify app. And I'll point out the uh, bottom right corner, if you go to that link, it'll take you to our website, which has all 13 of the, uh, of the strategies listed there. In case you don't want to take notes, you can jump on that. 
Uh, also, feel free, I'm not offended if you jump on your computer or your phone during the site and check out our website, uh, just primalpastors.com. Next strategy, it really works in with the, with the website, but it's email campaign. Email campaign destroys social media, it destroys anything else, you need to get people's email addresses. Why? Because, I don't know if you guys realize this, but when you post something to Facebook, usually between 5 and 10% of your following is actually going to see it. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's the, that's the truth right now. Same with Instagram. Uh, Instagram, I love, I think it's better than Facebook, but you, you have a very small percentage of your following actually see that. With an email, that is landing in their inbox 100% of the time. Whether they open it or not, you, you're not, you, know, you can't really control that. With MailChimp, which is uh, the email provider that we use, they let you track who's opened it, how many, what percentage of people have opened it, what percentage of people have clicked, what links did they actually click on within your email, and then they provide you these awesome templates. This is a, sort of what our email campaign looks like when it goes out to our customers. On our website, MailChimp lets you put a little box down there and say, subscribe for our newsletter. All they gotta do is type in their, news, type in their email and they're instantly added to your newsletter. Just from doing that, I've got over 2,000 people signed up on a mailing list right now so that every month when we have product ready, I send out one email, say, oh, here's kind of some of the stuff that we've got available, jump on, and, and the orders flood in. And so I can get all my pre-sales done right there. But MailChimp, uh, there's some other, like I said, there's other programs that do this. MailChimp is free until you have below 2,000 subscribers on it, which we just got over. So I'm like, gosh, it's kind of frustrating to have to pay for it now. But it's, uh, again, it totally pays for itself. Totally, totally worth it. Try to get your message into people's inbox first before you focus on doing other strategies. You've got to get it in their inbox. Speaking engagements are huge for us. We're, like I said, here in Southern California, um, people want to meet their farmer. They want to go talk to their farmer. Not everybody has time to drive out to the farm and go do all this different stuff. But we focused on two specific groups that I'll talk about briefly. We have the Paleo CrossFit group. Um, familiar or not familiar? If you're familiar with Paleo CrossFit-ish, okay, cool. Paleo CrossFit is this sort of Movement that's uh, picked up a lot of steam. CrossFit is a certain type of gym, workout, program, regimen, whatever. Um, they started with, I think, four gyms in 2006, and there's 4,000 now across the U.S. The, the reason why these guys are so good to market to is because they're the, the demographic that you want to shoot for. They're 25 to 40 years old. Uh, they're you know middle to upper class. They've got the money, and they're really, really big meat eaters. So for us, that's important, right? We want to get in contact with those people. These people, the gym owners want to provide some nutritional feedback somehow. And they're already coaching seven days a week. I mean, they don't have the time or the energy to sit there and, and teach about grass-fed meat. A lot of times they don't even necessarily have the deep enough knowledge or the photos or any of that stuff that, that they can share about you know, using this kind of food. So they're actively looking for people to come alongside of them. I mean, whatever area you're in, I guarantee you there's a CrossFit within a couple hours of where you're at. Um, I would reach out to all of them. Just say, hey, I'm a local farmer in town. If you ever do any kind of nutritional seminar or whatever, I'd love to be a part of it. Um, I can bring some food, you know, do a little potluck thing and share some of your, share some of your goods. Uh, and once you've, once you've had some face time with people, I'm not going to say that's a customer for life. Farm tour is a customer for life. But once you've had some face time with people, you have a very good chance at, at them becoming a customer and telling their friends and everything else. Okay, blogs are super critical for our business. Getting blogged about has been pretty much how we started our business. So I'll say we started our business on Facebook with a couple posts, but by reaching out to a few bloggers with large followings, you're not going to have a following in the beginning, right? I mean, maybe your friends will come like your page or kind of check you out or whatever, but if you can get your message relayed to a good blogger, um, our first guy that talked about us, he ended up being our neighbor, I didn't even know it. Um, he put a couple messages out there. He just so happens to have 100,000 people following on Facebook and 200,000 people on a mailing list. And from that day on, we've never been able to keep up with demand. And all it was, was I, I jumped onto Facebook. I found his personal profile, sent him a direct message and said, hey, I'm a new farm in the area. Uh, I'd love to send you a free sample of our product. No obligation at all to talk about us. I'm not expecting that. But if you like it, if you think it's cool and you want to say something, it'd be great. My cost on that, one chicken, whatever, 15 bucks or whatever, right? That's been, that's sustained our business for like four months. So uh, again, I'm talking about marketing strategies that are going to actually generate revenue and income, not just be an expense item on your farm. Um, 
we've been picked up in lots of different blogs now. And the cool thing about blogs is it's similar to speaking. Once you've been picked up by one, all the other bloggers say, oh, that person's talking about you know, grass-fed. We need to talk about grass-fed. So then you start getting the flood of all these different emails coming in. Um, you're not spending a lot of time on this. They blog about you. You're not generating this content. So if you could put together a little bit of a press kit, which is just your story, briefly, uh, and some nice photos, I'll recommend spending the money on professional photos from the get-go. It's worth it. It's 250 500 bucks. Um, the cool thing is a lot of photographers are really into the food movement. So a lot of times you can find somebody that you either trade for or delay payment on or whatever. So you can probably get it for free uh, or at least delay deeply discounted payment. Um, photographer, that will make people actually want to blog about you. Because you have ugly photos. I'm not a good photographer. Uh, I'm the first one to admit it. And that's probably why we've been successful because I know I'm not good. Ask a photographer if you're good. If you think you're good, ask a photographer if you're good. You might not be. Um, <laughs> But we had professional photos that we were able to then say, okay, here's five photos. Please use them in your blog if you want to come out and take your own. That'd be great. Um, and that's generated so much business for us, uh, DM blogged about. Bloggers are omnipresent. They're like international a lot of times. Um, it's better if you can find them in your area. And it's really hard to figure out where bloggers are actually located because they don't usually talk about that. So I would, I would go into whatever niche you think is going to be best for you, CrossFit, Paleo, blogs. This is the good thing about the market. Super passionate food people that are really, really active online. So if you can get picked up by one of these bloggers, um, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna go viral really quick. You can just type into Google um, "organic vegetable blog" if that's what you do. If you do organic vegetable, like organic vegetable blog, and you'll find you have hundreds of pages of, of bloggers. I mean, this is unlimited amount of work. If you have unlimited product to sell, you could hire somebody to do this full time and they would pay for their own salary, I promise you. Okay, guest blogs, totally different. Guest blog is instead of them writing a blog about me, I'm writing a blog about myself, and they're gonna put it on their site. And they'll review it, and they'll check it out. This is one of ours from the middle of our Kickstarter. This is called Mark's Daily Apple. It's the number five health site in the world. I basically contacted them totally randomly um, and said, you know, I'd love to do a guest blog, talk a little bit about my story, and uh, a little bit about our business, but I'd like to just tell the story, because on this specific blog on Fridays, they have these personal success stories or whatever, that's their theme. Um, this blog gets 160,000 unique visitors daily. So you can imagine when this post went up, we had like 10,000 hits to our website within two hours, we shut our website down. And that's again, that, that was like less than an hour of work for me to go write up a quick blog, I already had all the photos done, it's just reaching out to these people and being okay with rejection. When you go to reach out to bloggers, you're gonna get rejected like 90% of the time. But the cool thing is, you can have a template of email that just customize the top line and you can send it out to 30, 40 people in, in 20 minutes. You know? um, but this blog, this was a guest blog. They didn't write about us, I wrote about us. And uh, I mean, it just exploded our business. We were in the middle of a Kickstarter and uh, if you know what a Kickstarter is, usually you get a bunch of momentum in the beginning, then it's flat through the middle and then you get a little kick at the end. This came right in the middle of our Kickstarter, and it was like this event, boom, $20,000 in two days, just off of that one block alone. It was crazy. I told you I was gonna do social media in the beginning. Sorry, I put it a little bit in, in the middle. Um, Facebook is kind of near and dear to my heart because that is where we started our business. The first few posts that I put up were on Facebook, and I invited all my friends. We made a page, a business page, which is what you wanna do for your farm. Make sure you have a business page, not your personal page. It's okay to have both, but make sure you have a, a business page first. Um, and we invited all of our friends onto it, and then basically, this is how we <coughs> completely started our business. I mean, everything that we did was on here. We weren't getting a lot of traffic to our website at first, but when the bloggers talk about you, they can link you right in, and they take you right to your Facebook page, and so you get a lot of people start liking your page. We don't have a big page. It's not really a focus of our business anymore. We have 5,800 people following, and like I said, on any given post, we're getting five to 10% of that, so we maybe have, I don't know, 200, 50 to maybe 2,000 people seeing every post, which is okay. I mean, it's, it's not great, but it's okay. The one distinct advantage that you have on Facebook over any other platform, well, over Instagram, I'm not gonna talk about Twitter. I don't think it's really appropriate for a farm. We can talk about that in a question later. Um, but on Facebook, you can put a link in. You can say, uh, you know, we have uh, some extra rump roast, so we just discounted. Here's the link, and they can just, they can be so lazy that they're laying in bed, 
click the link and go all the way through our thing and purchase product, you know, right before they fall asleep or whatever. So this is good for the very lazy consumer, which is 90% of the consumer. I'm one of them. I know how it is. You don't really want to go out of your way to do stuff. So uh, Facebook is good for that. Let's just talk about Facebook for a second since this is supposed to be social media. You want to engage people in a very real way on, on these social media channels. And so when we've had our best success, it's when we're telling our story. And you can try to get, you know, oh, what's your favorite meat? Like I see a lot of people that are just trying to get comments and responses and likes, and they fall into this total popularity contest where it's like, oh, if I didn't get like 50 people to like that post and you know you start feeling bummed out or like people aren't paying attention to you or whatever, that's not what it's about. You're trying to get direct access to your customer base, and this is somewhere you can really interact with your customers. When you're not out there at farmers markets, you're not doing different things. Every day I have somebody come up on Facebook and say, oh yeah, my beef was really good, or oh, yeah, what's the best way to cook this? Or like, negative feedback is good feedback too. Uh, the last pork chop that I got was a little bit skinny or whatever. You know, you want to hear all that stuff. So any channel that you have, you get that dialogue between your customers, that's good. Just don't spend too much time on it and don't fall into the popularity trap. What the key with social media is that you want to be connecting to the target market that you're going after. It's not like you're just trying to get uh, somebody in the middle of Australia. I don't really care if somebody in the middle of Australia likes my post. It doesn't do anything um, for our business. So I'm trying to get targeted advertising for free off of Facebook. That's all that we go for in there. What we've really come to generate more business off of now is Instagram. I don't know if you guys have read the studies. People are flooding away. They're running away from Facebook at like this unprecedented rate. Nobody's on Facebook anymore. Our customers, 25 to 40, they're off Facebook. They're, they're totally getting away from it now. Everybody's on Instagram. This is a total moving target, right? I get it. Like the, the social media thing, it'll be Instagram for a while. It'll go to something else next. But you have to be able to tell your story on multiple platforms. So right now, we spend a lot of time on Instagram. Yes, so Instagram is similar to Facebook, but it focuses more on just the photos. You can't link. You can't uh, do some of the different things that you can in Facebook. It's a simpler version of Facebook. It's a social media channel. You basically take a photo, and this is what's beautiful about it for farmers. This right here, where is it? This is like as effective as my shovel, my chicken feed, or anything else. I'm walking around with this every day that I do chores, and I'm in a beautiful environment every day. People want to be part of that environment, right? So when they're watching, their, you know, the people post the photos of their kids and all that other stuff on Instagram, and then they see a beautiful photo of, you know, of Jane or of the turkey or of the lambs out grazing or a video or something. It's so dynamic and it really changes their mind. They love to see that kind of stuff. And how much effort is it for me? I'm already doing the chores anyways. I'm out with the animals. I'm in the grass. It's beautiful outside. So there we go. Boom, 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 boom. Three button click and I'm done for the day. That's my marketing for the day. It's like less than two minutes. It, yeah, people people want to be a part of that. Like they want to deeply desire to get back to the land. But most people, whatever happens, they're they're still sitting in their cubicle. They're still sitting in their house. Maybe they, they wish they could be at the farm or whatever. But you're really able to tell that story. You're able to connect them with your environment through picture, and that's really important to people. Here's an example. This is again. This is at Tyfe's farm that we're running the heritage pasture turkeys on, and that's what comes up. I mean, it's not it's not an awesome photo or anything, but Instagram. They have, the, they have these filters, and that's what's really making Instagram take it off, is they're, they have these beautiful filters that make pictures look really cool without having any photography experience. So you basically scroll through, you say, oh, I like how it looks with that filter on it, and then you're done. So that's my post. Oh, I'm excited about the newest edition of Primal Pastures. You know, we tell the story. We had the Kickstarter, and now I'm so excited to have these turkeys because of you guys who helped us with the story, with the, with the turkeys. Um, and you, you really try to bring people into your story, too. When you're first starting out your page, what he's saying is that just by commenting on other people's pages, that's going to get them onto, onto your site and ultimately drive traffic back to your site. So if you, don't have anybody, you know, if you don't have anybody liking your photos or commenting on your photos, what you can do is go like a couple other photos. Maybe I'm going to like the, uh, the Western A. Price um, LA page. And then I'm going to go on there and they're going to post something about beef. And I'll give... I'm not just going to say, oh, come check out Primal Pastures. No, don't be cheesy about it. You have to make an insightful, interesting comment back on that page. And the page owner is going to love that. They're probably going to come like your page. And they'll probably share something about you at some point, or at least initiate that conversation. Or at a minimum, you're getting into their brave brain wave for that day or for that 10 minutes or something. And it's all about having touches with these people constantly. You want them to be 
thinking about you at least you know, every couple of days. You don't want to lose touch with them ever. So social media is a good way you can do that. I think there's, yeah, yes sir. Do you always add text? How often do you add text to it versus just Only if it makes sense. I mean, you guys can jump on our Instagram feed and check it out on your phones right now. It's just at Primal Pastures is our, is our site. Um, I usually throw some kind of text on there, but it's definitely not required. Um, I always try to bring it back to telling some kind of a story and making something engaging. I'm not just trying to throw out you know, random information. Uh, always trying to tell some kind of a story. Yeah, I, we have a link on our business card. We also have a link on our website. We also talk about our Instagram on our Facebook, and we talk about our Facebook on our Instagram. So when you're generating followers at one, kind of want to following you everywhere possible. I don't know if you guys are up on the hashtag thing. The hashtag is kind of really confusing to explain, but uh, at the end of your post or in the middle of your post, you can, uh, how do I even describe it? Um, you can put like a, like a hashtag in front of a word, and then somebody can just click on that word, and then they're taking everybody else who made that hashtag. So if I, if I type in, Pasture beef on my hashtag, then somebody can just type in pasture beef and they find my post just by doing that. Or if I type in like a, you know, grass farmer, then I'm one of the only people that usually post about grass farmer, so they can go check that out or whatever. Um, I'll, I'll sh if, if you're confused by that, I'm not surprised. It's a very confusing description. <laughs> I'll show you it afterwards. It'll make a lot more sense. Is there like a place you can like Google like how to do hashtags or something like that? Um, What's even better, I'm sure you could, but what's even better is just go to somebody with a lot of followers and see how they do it. You can learn a lot just by watching, watching other people in this. This is an awesome website. I don't know if you get it, heard of Eat Wild or not. Oh, no. That's a lot of people that haven't heard of it. Eat Wild is huge for our business. Uh, this is one of the few things that we pay for, 50 bucks a year. And I can't tell you how many whole cows have already sold just straight off of Eat Wild. 100% worth it. Um, Eat Wild basically lists, it's a, it's a directory page, and so people that are looking for local food, they can type in where they're at, they click on their state, on their city, on their county, and it's pasture-based farms is what's supposed to go on at Eat Wild. Permaculture farms, pasture-based farms, um, the people that are in this room should be on Eat Wild, and I don't work for Eat Wild, I promise you. Here's what's really cool for us about Eat Wild, I don't have a pointer, but um, this is a map of all the pasture, pasture-based farms in Southern California that are on Eat, or in California that are on Eat Wild right now. You can see the dots all up, up, up above LA. You know how many people are south of LA? 22 million. You know how many farms that it lists down there? One, us. Oh. <laughs> you know how much business I'm getting from that? Me on that, right? Eat Wild uh, is not our biggest source of, uh, of traffic, but it's an awesome source of traffic because you get educated, very, very educated consumers coming through Eat Wild um, who typically are not, what I've noticed is a lot of people that are on Eat Wild aren't spending a lot of time on social media. I don't know why, but it's a little bit different crowd. You get a little bit, uh, you get a little bit more mature customer who's maybe better on the block a couple of times on Eat Wild. That's who you want. You want that mature customer. It's great. Yes, sir. Is it a directory and a link that links to your website or do you yeah. have a profile that you It has there? a small profile with a link to your website. Super basic. It's like a Google map, basically. That, uh, Eat Wild, they kind of do their homework. So if you're on Eat Wild, that's a good indication that you're legit and you're up to snuff. And so Eat Wild, they go through and they vet your profile and look at stuff. And uh, if you're not doing a good job, you're monocropping, you're not getting on Eat Wild, they're not going to let you on. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. You get you get somebody who's already kind of trusts what you're saying. So Shopify is a is a website building platform. Uh, that's no shop. I, I go on to Shopify to create my website, PrimalPastures.com. And then that's the back end. That's all the different stuff. They, they help me manage the inventory and everything. So it's not a separate website at all. I use Shopify to make my website. You do not want to confuse people ever. You want to be so basic that uh, a caveman could do it. Like, uh, all, of our, all of our customers are like cavemen because they're these paleo people. But, um, no, you want, it to be, you want it to be as simple, seamless. I mean, like I said, you want to be laying in bed half asleep and say, oh, I feel like bratwurst in the morning, uh, boom, ordered a bratwurst, right? Like, that's how easy you want it to be. He's asking how we sell different cuts of meat, because they all weigh a little bit different. I could have a package of ground beef that's a pound, and then I could have one that's 1.2 pounds or something. We sell everything on average. So uh, it is what it is. Uh, sometimes you're going to get a little bit less, sometimes you get a little bit more, but we sell like a 1.1 pound average ground beef, um, and we sell a av five pound average chicken. There's no other way for me to do that. I mean, I've got thousands of different cuts in my freezers, and uh, for me to be able to say, oh, you bought the 1.23 pound ground beef, and then go dig through everything to find the 1.23 pound ground beef, not gonna happen. So if you wanna pre-sell 
um, you have to sell an average, and you got to kind of get your customers used to that. Bit of fun. We have had very little negative feedback about it, actually. We state our average slightly lower than what it actually is, so that, sure, I mean, if you run the numbers, maybe we are losing a little bit more money on that, but uh, to be able to do it and to save the time, 100% worth it. Okay, Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a marketing tool. Um, don't think of it as anything else, okay? You can you see a lot of big numbers coming off of Kickstarter. What is Kickstarter? It's a crowdfunding platform, non-equity based. So you post up a video, you say this is what I want to do, and um, people basically back you. You have rewards. So it's not a straight donation, but they're not getting equity in your company. It's a, for example, we put ours up. We have thirty-five dollars. You get a T-shirt. Obviously, T-shirts are not thirty-five dollars. So. There's an element of a donation with an element of them getting something and supporting what you want to do. So we told our story of, look, we're at a brand new farm, we want to grow, we want to do this and that, um, and we did really well on it. Can you shoot a video that looks like that on your own? <laughs> Guess how much we paid for that video? Zero. Zero. Kind of. We paid on a percentage of whatever we raised on Kickstarter. So the videographer took a little bit of the risk on that, but she made pretty good money since we did pretty well on the Kickstarter. Uh, she was a former customer. This is a really cool story, actually. I'll, I'll get your question for sure. But uh, our first like 20 people that signed up for the mailing list, I started stalking them like crazy, like Googling them, trying to figure out what they did. Because I really wanted to understand who was coming to our site and why. Um, so this lady pops up, oh, something, something design. Cool. Google her. Third most followed person on Pinterest. Interesting. She's like 3 million followers, and she's a graphic designer. I contacted her that day, and I said, you will never pay for food at Primal Passions in your life uh, if you want to trade. You know? The barter system is amazing. If you have a product that people want, you can get anything. I paid, um, that's appropriate to say, I paid for <coughs> my wife's midwife and doula with chicken. The whole thing. <laughs> awesome. The whole homer. Totally paid for it. Sweet. Um, yeah, so we paid a straight up percentage of whatever we raised. And here's the thing, $60,000, a lot of money, right? There's a lot of that that you don't end up with, okay? Kickstarter and Amazon take like 10% straight off the top. You're gonna have to fulfill all these rewards, which are, you teach, I mean, that cost alone, that's 35, 40% of whatever we had. Um, we paid a couple bloggers, like a percent each, to basically have a vested interest to promote the Kickstarter, which is worth it, by far worth it. But you start to chip away, and eventually you end up at, 30 or 40 percent of whatever you raise. It's not bad, right? I'm not. I'm happy to walk away with twenty thousand dollars at the end of the day, but I probably made four or five bucks an hour because this thing was a lot of work. The reason it's worth it is because of not the fifty-seven, eight, ten right there. It's because the number right above that, six hundred ninety people came behind us and supported us and put some kind of financial pledge down. That's six hundred ninety people. Maybe a hundred of them were already customers, but that's like six hundred new people into our pipeline that have heard our story, that understand what we're about. That's like a succinct, quick two minute way to get somebody you know, to really believe in your story and to, and to come along and fight you. So that's why I say Kickstarter is a marketing tool. It's not the savior for your business. It's not gonna save you, you know, on your way down or something like that. But, but as a marketing tool, it's awesome, but be prepared to work 10 hours a day for two months, literally. It's about what, about what I did. I, yes, sir. Did you offer discounts on the award models? Discount on our product? Yeah. We actually did. Uh, and I don't recommend it typically, but we um, we offered it. We, we do chicken for $25 a pop and one of our rewards, because I wanted to get the rewards up a little higher. The average Kickstarter backer comes in at the $25 level, and we wanted to see what we could do to get that a little bit higher. So one of our rewards was a chicken every year for 12 months um, for 250 So usually that would be 300 we did it for 250, but when you spread out everything that far, and you know, we uh, it, it was worth it for sure. But here's the thing: you got to have really high margins on these Kickstarter boards. Do 80% margin margins. Cost. So the beauty is that they get used to coming on your site, coming to your pickup drop, you know, doing all the normal stuff. And if you can get them used to being a part of your pipeline, that's a customer for sure. It's worth it. Yes, sir. So you're telling me you didn't actually do this to raise money, but to raise customer base. I did it to raise money, and then I realized that the money really wasn't worth my time, but the customer base was. You want to spend four to ten hours a day hitting up bloggers, building your network. One thing I want you to take away from this talk is that you want to dig your well before you're thirsty. That's like one of the things we really, really believe in. 
always have a well. Always have that network before times are tough. Because when they do get tough, you don't want to be the broke guy asking for money. Nobody wants to be in that, in that situation. So 30 days before our product even launched, I was talking to bloggers, get, sending out our media pack, putting together our, our rewards. Um, we became like a, a apparel shipping company for like 30 days. I mean, it was hard to even get the chores done in the morning and night because we were shipping t-shirts and you know coordinating drops and pickups and it was, it was crazy. But if you are going to do this, have everything ready to go before you launch. You should have your vendors all set up. You should have your designs to the vendors. Everything should be plug and play so that once you're funded, um, all you have to do is click a button and those orders start coming in. Because even us, we had that all set up. We still didn't get rewards out for like three months after um, after the project ended. You're busy. You're so busy. You have, <coughs> look at this. This is a, that's like a sample of all the people that talked about our project while we were doing the while we were doing the Kickstarter. People love coming around this and they love feeling like they're part of building a farm in their community. And, and we have international and local and everything, but these are all, some of these, Huffington Post, <coughs> MSN.com. I mean, some of these are huge. Permaculture Voice is massive. <laughs> <laughs> Agricultural Insects, right there. You help us out. Um, you're, you're really busy with media stuff, with fulfilling orders, with everything that's crazy, and trying to run a farm, right? You're already busy running a farm. You're already working 10 hours a day. If you don't hit your goal, you don't get the dollar, and everything goes to waste. That's an important one. Yeah. Indiegogo is a similar platform where even if you don't hit your goal, you're still going to get the money that you did raise. On Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. So if we would have got 39999 and it ended, zero. All that work for nothing. So you don't want to pick something you can get. And you can always go over, but you need to be able to justify, okay, you said that you're going to raise $40,000 for this. So then why would I come in and give you, get you up to 50000 What are you going to do with the money? So we were pretty clear. A lot of you know, updates, a lot of you know, telling people as well, if you put in more, if we raise more, we're doing more animals. That's all it's going to be. So, so it's, the stretch goals, I think, for farm are pretty clear. you got to buy more stuff. Can do it. Okay, farm tours, huge part of our business right now. We're located close to a lot of people. I know that's probably why. Uh, we sell tickets for five bucks a pop, and we have 50 people. I mean, it sells out every time. Uh, two or three days, we sell out the farm tour. We have 50 people come. Awesome for kids, even better for adults. That's what I always say. You've been to a farm tour, right? Yeah. We love connecting people to their food. It's what we're passionate about. And once you have a customer on your farm for a farm tour, they're a customer for life, and they're going to tell their friends. It's a really positive experience. We have people coming from downtown LA, and we're all involved in this thing. So you know, we see chickens and stuff all the time. But when somebody's been in a high rise for three years, and they can get out and step on grass and see a chicken, see an egg, it's like mind blown. Like, what? A chicken? An egg, grass. It's like it's the most awesome thing I've ever seen. So, farm tours, do it. I don't know if you can charge five. You can probably charge fifty in some areas, but we like to do low price, and then we sell product on site. We have two people running the farm tours. I would recommend capping it low at first, and maybe slowly going up. We tried to do even sixty-five one time. It was like chaos. The sheep. One of the kids pulled the fence down. The sheep got out. It was running around. <laughs> Not worth it. <laughs> yes. Would you run through exactly what you do and what you're talking about? That's a good question. I don't really have to do that much. We basically, I walk through my daily chores and say, uh, this is what I do on a daily basis. And it's, it's seems like when you're in the position that I'm in, it's like, this nobody cares. But people love it. They love to see, oh, here's the chick. And then from, from the chick, it comes out of the brooder and then it goes into this pen. Then from the pen, we kind of walk them through. You know, this, it goes to an egg layer or it becomes a meat bird. And then we, this is kind of how we process. We don't necessarily show them the process anyway. <laughs> show them the equipment and we kind of, if, if you're interested, we show them that. And then what it really is is social hour. You know how many people are into this movement and they feel like they're just in a silo and they're this crazy, foody, weird person and nobody understands and nobody gets it? Well, now you have 50 people just like you and everybody just loves talking to other people. So that brings me to our next one, I think. Um, potlucks, man, potlucks are so fun. We do either, either free or like three bucks to cover, you know, porta potties and stuff, but we love to do a potluck maybe once every season. So like once every three months. And we bring a lot of people out for this because it's low maintenance. I mean, people are bringing their own food. You basically just get some tables or just tell them to bring blankets. And, uh, we did our last one. We teamed up with Weston A. Price. So <coughs> the local Weston A. Price chapter came and she talked and then we talked a little bit, but mostly just, 
let's just get together, have a good, like, warm community event here on the farm and eat good food. And it, the food was incredible. I would do it again just so I could eat that food. <laughs> yes. Do you just admit the more you cap it at a certain amount? For the potluck? Yeah. We cap it whatever our parking can handle. We don't have a big parking area, so that's our limit. I would do 500 people, though. It's not really that hard to manage. The curb of cattle. <laughs> <laughs> if you can figure out some way to take your problem and turn it into a solution, you're you going to be better off. So try to take your marketing expense and turn it into income and, and build that experience for people uh, when they're on the farm. You guys have been awesome. If you have any other questions, please, please, please come up after. There you have it, Paul Grieve of Primal Pastures. If you want to view this presentation that you just heard, see the slides and see what Paul was actually talking about, be sure to sign up for our mailing list at grassfedlife.co. Later this week, we're going to send out an email to the mailing list with this presentation included in that email. And if you want to learn more from Paul out here at Primal Pastures in Murrieta, California, that's in Southern California between San Diego and Los Angeles, be sure to check out the Growing Your Farm Business Mastermind Workshop. That's a workshop that only has six tickets left. Yes, just six. The event's about six weeks away. I don't think those six tickets are going to last till the end. So if you want to come, get them now because they will likely be gone in a matter of time. If you come out, you'll be one of the few people to attend this very exclusive small number of attendee workshop where you're going to get a lot of hands-on attention. Learn all about the value and benefits that you're going to get when you come to this exclusive intensive workshop at grassfedlife.co. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.